Okay, great. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Sunday morning. So glad that you've taken the time to come join uh, myself as well as our mentors, Tristan and Shrivika, to learn more about careers and consulting. Uh, this is a very, very exciting field and we're very, very privileged to have two mentors who have such extensive experience in this field, sharing their experiences uh, with us today. So before I uh, hand it over to them to introduce, just wanted to let you know what the format's going to be like for today's session. So it will be a fireside chat or a coffee or a coffee table chat uh, with the mentors. Uh, I will be the facil facilitator and I'll ask our mentors questions and that will take about 40 minutes. We'll cover topics uh, including uh, what do consultants do, um, why consulting, who, who might suit a career in this field, um, also questions on recruitment, uh, co questions on career path. So we'll cover those kinds of topics. And we'll make sure to leave 20 minutes at the end so that you can ask any questions that you have. Now, if you do have questions during the session, you can also type them in the chat and we'll pick them up at the end of uh, during the Q&A part. Um, but ideally, please do raise your voice also because it's a good chance for you to get the mentors to know you, uh, especially if you want to connect with us on LinkedIn afterwards. It helps us to put a, a face to the name, okay? So if you can turn on your videos, that'd be much appreciated. Okay, so with that, I will hand it over to our mentors to introduce themselves and tell us about their past that led them to consulting. And Shrivika, if I could start off with you. Thanks, Adeline. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you guys. Uh, and thanks for making it so bright and early on a Sunday morning at 9.30. A um, little bit about my history in consulting. So I started right out of undergrad back many, many years ago. Um, I went to university at SMU in Singapore and then started at Bain in 2010 um, as an analyst. And we had at that time 60 people in the Singapore office. And now we're at, um, we have 250 people and we have four offices across Southeast Asia. So the industry has really changed and grown from when I joined to what it is right now. Um, and then I did four years of consulting and then quit four years into that and then went and did, worked in the for-profit education space in, in, in Kenya, then went to business school um, and then post business school was wondering what I wanted to do. Um, and then it felt like the right time to come back to consulting. So I rejoined Bain uh, in the Singapore office two years ago. Um, and in terms of the type of work that I do, I am focused on uh, consumer products. So I do private equity work. Uh, so when a um, private equity fund is buying an asset, they come to us and say, uh, is this a good deal or not? What's the prospects? So we do the diligences on that. Um, and then I focus on working with consumer product companies. So the likes of um, imagine the Unilevers and the Cooks and the uh, and all of the diaper and personal care companies of the world. So that's the area of work that I do. Um, and I am a senior manager at Bain. And essentially what that means is I help um, deliver projects, manage our teams, manage our clients, um, and help make sure the work gets done um, uh, overall. But yes, we'll have a long in and out history with, with Bain. Um, and um, I really enjoy the work. Fantastic, Shabika. And if you could just let our audience, uh, let our mentees know, what was your undergraduate degree in? Uh, so I did a bachelor in business management and finance, and um, I major in economics. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And Tristan, over to you. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, name is Tristan Francis. I'm originally from New York. I had went to undergrad at Wharton, studied finance, legal studies, and business ethics while I was there, and then actually didn't start my career out in, in consulting, started my career out in investment banking, covering consumer retail companies uh, with Morgan Stanley, and then a few different roles also with Morgan Stanley. It was sales and trading, uh, a strategy role that was focused on increasing business with Asian, Black, and Hispanic clients, uh, as well as uh, human capital and, and talent management role. So bounced around a good amount while I was there. During that whole period, I knew that I eventually wanted to go to business school. So my thought process was trying to get a holistic view of the industry. And then I also knew that after business school, I wanted to pivot into consulting. Uh, while I was living in New York, one of my roommates was working at BCG. Another one of my roommates was working at Bain. Uh, and so I was comparing their lifestyle and consulting and the type of work they were doing to the kind of uh, lifestyle I had and the, the type of work I was doing. And I... I 
felt like consulting was going to be a much better fit for me eventually. So uh, I went into business school kind of knowing that that would be the plan on the way out. Um, and then after business school, so I had done my internship, uh, my MBA internship in BCG's Philadelphia office, had an offer to return to Philly, uh, and then requested the transfer over to Singapore. I don't have any uh, direct family ties in the region, but so my dad is from Jamaica, my mom is from Cleveland with uh, Russian and Czech roots. Um, so no kind of ties to Southeast Asia necessarily. Um, but my mom's thinking about retiring uh, somewhere in, in Thailand or somewhere in the region. And so being here, uh, the thought process was let me help her scope out the region, figure out where she'll live, what she'll do, that kind of thing. Um, and also get some really great international working experience and so forth. So have been here for about a year and a half at this point. Um, as a consultant with BCG and uh, yeah, have really, I mean, I think that it's lived up to what I was hoping it would be in terms of seeing a variety of uh, projects. I've already, my, my five projects so far have spanned, it's been healthcare, financial services, chemicals, telecommunications, and then mining. So I've done the real uh, very random walk generalist at the moment. Um, but yeah, looking forward to today and, and, and having a candid conversation around whatever would be most helpful. Awesome, thank you so much, Tristan. And uh, and actually everyone today, you're gonna get a bonus half mentor, which is me. So while I'm facilitating today's session, I was also, I also started life as a consultant. So I was actually uh, employee number nine in McKinsey's office in Singapore. <laughs> this was many, many years ago. Uh, so similar to Shrivika, I, I applied to McKinsey out of school. I, I did my degree in law, uh, but I was very interested in, uh, in, in, the in the management side, the business side of things. So I applied to McKinsey and I was um, one of the first hires in that office. I spent four years at McKinsey in Singapore. Then I went to get my MBA and then I joined a boutique consulting firm. So I can also speak about people who are interested in boutique consulting firms, apart from the big three consulting firms I represented today. Um, and then I pivoted out of consulting. So then I went into consumer products <clears throat> in various com uh, companies and consumer products, most recently in Coca-Cola. And now I'm an entrepreneur. So I run a startup business, an online startup business in mental health. So I've done various things and very happy as well to share my experiences in consulting and also career paths that consulting can lead you to after that. Okay, so... With that, uh, the next question. So for some of our audience uh, who may not be that familiar with consulting, how would you describe what you do to your mother? So maybe I can start with you, Tristan, and then Shrivika. Yeah, um, so the analogy I like to use is that I think that uh, if I was describing it to my mom who has no sort of business background, I would almost describe it as a way that a doctor helps a patient, uh, but instead of helping a patient we're helping a company, meaning a company has some sort of um, problem or challenge that they're trying to solve. And the first thing that you do is you listen to that problem, you listen to that problem, you understand the symptoms of it, basically what's going on, and then you prescribe something. And that is the equivalent of a strategy that we're proposing to a company. Um, so our client comes with the, to us with an issue and very oftentimes the, the listening point part is very important in consulting because, you know, a company might come and say, we're having an issue with A, B, and C, but through a series of questions that we ask and, and our teams oftentimes have people with varying levels of experience and some senior people that have seen a lot of things within the industries that we do work. So we might recognize a pattern of, okay, hey, you're saying that A, a, B, and C is your problem, but based on what we're observing, maybe X, Y, and Z is actually the problem. Um, and so it, there's a lot of analysis that goes on. I, I, I know I've oversimplified it. There's a lot of analysis that goes on between those, but I think it's a combination of really actively listening to the challenge that your client is facing and then prescribing a strategy and a path forward for them to be able to uh, improve upon that in the area that they're looking to. Awesome, Tristan. And maybe can I stick with you for a little bit longer, mm -hmm. just to give the audience a, an idea of the of the breadth of kinds of projects that you do. Maybe you can highlight two projects, two very yeah. different projects that you've worked on as a consultant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the most recent project that I'm working on, it is with a mining company. And basically, they 
operate largely in the coal space, uh, which coal is a dying industry. So they're, you know, looking up and saying, okay, how can we remain relevant even as this industry dies? And so we were coming up with an entirely new business model um, and how they would interact with other players within the ecosystem. A lot of it had to do with how do you bring in stakeholders, different investors and so forth to try and fund smaller mining exploration companies so that um, they can then be a provider of um, basically all of the construction type services. So creating like ancillary businesses, like creating new businesses beyond what they've done in the past, recognizing that the industry is, um, is uh, you know, ha having, having challenges in terms of their core business. So that was like one, one project that, that was a lot of outreach to different uh, investment firms, a lot of, uh, and a lot of thinking outside of the box. So this was a very like, brainstorming and, and whiteboarding type of thing because they came to us and they were literally like, we're open to anything. We just need a different business model because the one that we have is no longer gonna work in 10 or 15 years. So that was one project. Um, and then one that was very different from that is I was working for a telecommunications company um, and they had a much more defined thing that they were looking to do. Basically we were working for their enterprise business unit. Um, and if a person were to call this company, if one of their clients were to call this company to raise a ticket or an issue that they were having, there would be 10 different people that would get involved in the process of opening a ticket. And, and I'm not even exaggerating on that. So they had to like redesign their customer journey because there was just so many policies that they had put in place over the years that it wasn't practical and customers were getting really frustrated because they would open a ticket with person A. Um, and then when they would be passed off to like five or six different people that also needed to open a ticket and it was taking a really long time. So basically what we did is we came in and we looked at all of the steps in their process and then came up with a much more simplified way of when a customer has an issue and they call in, how do you basically uh, go from A to Z as quickly as possible. Um, but that project was very different because unlike the first one, which was very open-ended brainstorming, this one was like a very specific thing that they were looking for. Um, and we just had to kind of like redesign the customer journey. Awesome. That's, that's, that's brilliant. Two really, really different types of projects in different industries and different problems that you help to solve. And uh, by the way, uh, mentees, as you listen to the mentors talk, if certain questions come up in your mind, you can put them in the chat. Okay. And then we'll, we, we, can, we can answer those uh, later on. And Shivika, over to you. How would you describe consulting to your mother or someone who's not familiar with this field? Thanks, Nigel. I think it's very similar to Tristan. My go-to phrase is we're doctors to companies as well. Um, and I think it sounds quite like esoteric, but the, but the idea is a lot of it is about pattern recognition, as Tristan was mentioning earlier. And the more companies you look at and the more you, you specialize in a particular field or across industries, you get better at really seeing what the challenges are. Um, and it's surprising how many firms actually have very similar problems um, and similar reasons why they have those issues. Um, so I think it's like going, it's going to a doctor and kind of getting that diagnosis done. Um, and um, it's very interesting work because you're essentially talking to decision makers in the organization and helping them change their perspectives and their mindsets. Um, and you're often, you, you might be lucky enough to be there for a long time to help implement and see some of these initiatives through and these strategies through. But sometimes projects are much more just about diagnosing and then enabling the companies to go and do it themselves. Um, so it's not just about saying coming up with the right solution, but also coming up with how do you change the mindset? How do you change the perspective? How do you get people to get buy-in um, to drive some of these solutions and actually make it stick? Because otherwise they spend a lot of money asking us for the right answer um, and then it goes to the wayside. So I think part of what makes the job fun also is making sure uh, they take their medicine um, and how do you convince them to take their medicine? So. Great. And any favorite projects that you'd like to share with the, uh, the team? Yeah. So last year, I spent about eight months in Malaysia. So even though I was based in Singapore, I'd fly, fly, fly to Malaysia Monday to Thursday. And I was working on a really cool project where um, the company that we were working for was really, they were a distributor. 
um, of goods. And essentially, they realized that they were A, both not growing in terms of their revenue, and B, that their margins were kind of flat. Um, and they wanted us to come in and help them fix that problem. But it wasn't just a diagnostic piece of work. We actually ran uh, a program where we, where we were with the clients on the ground for eight months and actually helped implement um, a lot of the work that we were doing. Um, so it really felt like I was actually working as part of this company. So I had a desk at the client office. I would go in as if I was going into work um, at my job. Um, and we would really get into the nitty gritties of like making change at a tactical level. So whether it was at a supply chain basis, we change like minimum order quantities because we realized that their order quantities were, were messing up their flow. We changed their inventory management system. Uh, it was simple things like um, uh, how do you uh, change their, their ordering interface when a sales rep goes to take an order? So it was very, very like tactical. So we spent about a month and a half like diagnosing all the different areas that they were losing money and they could accelerate their, their revenue. Um, and then we spent the remaining six months on the ground, really with the clients working in the trenches. Um, it was a very interesting experience because you actually feel like I that felt like my office uh, and home for eight months. Um, and I literally used to sit next to my main client map and we'd like go for lunch together and work as if we were on the same team. Um, so you, you get the experiences of like porting into companies um, and working very closely with them and then being able to step back out and do it in another company. Um, so that was the one of my recent highlights. Fantastic. Awesome. And I, I think everyone can hear, you know, the kinds of work that you work on. So as a consultant, you do basically projects. Some of these projects can be very short term. They can be three weeks. Some of these projects can be one year, even more than one year, where you work with that client and you help the client on, on those kinds of projects. So one thing that consultants do that it will be different from other jobs that you're looking at um, mentees will be that this is a very much project based uh, career which gives you the variety of work, um, both in terms of the clients that you serve, the industries that they're in, the problems that you're helping them with. So it defi it definitely, if it's, someone, if, if it's someone who's looking for a variety in what you do, um, this, is, this is a career that you can consider. Um, and briefly from my side, uh, during my uh, probably six years in consulting, the kinds of projects that I worked on, I would put them in three categories uh, of which Tristan and, and Trivika have talked about some of them. So the first kind of category, I think of them as pure strategy projects. And these are typically projects that deal with, say, new market entry. So should I enter a new market, can be, say, Myanmar, or should I enter a new category in that market. So for example, uh, for a beverage company, right? If you've been selling a dairy, so milk products, suddenly you want to sell more tea products, you know, some of those questions they might come to a consultant to ask. So that's the first category of projects or strategy projects. The second category of projects I would frame, uh, I would put as operations. And that's like what Tristan mentioned, the mining project uh, that he that he did, which is how do you, oh, sorry, not the mining, the telco project that you did, which is how do you improve the operations uh, in a company? It can be customer service as Tristan did. For me, I did one in a hospital where it was very similar. It's like, how do you get more patients through the hospital uh, by improving the processes, but basically trying to improve the core operations of the, uh, of the, of the company. And then the third set of projects would be what Shivika mentioned, which is around organization and change management. So with every strategy, typically you have to change something that people are doing. So knowing how to manage that change is a very critical part. And that becomes more of the how of human behavior. How do you get people to change behavior? Okay. So just to give you a sense of how broad the kinds of problems that you can handle as a consultant. Okay, so with that, the next question I have to uh, Shrivika and Tristan would be, wow, that's a lot of things. So what kind of background do I need? What kind of background do you look for? So Shrivika, if I could start with you. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the beauty, beautiful things about consulting is that you learn on the job. Like you don't, you're not expected to come in knowing an industry. You're not expected to come in knowing how to think about uh, cracking the consumer experience journey. I think what you're expected to come in with is two or three things. One is just a solid analytical foundation, um, uh, which I think is important in terms of being able to grasp concepts, being able to work 80-20, sense check your answers, do your, do your, run your analytics. 
I think the second is coming in with the ability to think analytically as well as creatively. So problem solving and brainstorming is another big thing. Um, the third one really is about having the right EQ and client skills. So it's about making sure your, your professional presentable can relate to both your teams internally as well as to your clients. And then I think the last one and the most important is like a learning mindset that comes with a lot of grit and dedication. So I would say um, you come in and you learn on the job and the whole idea is that it's an apprenticeship model. Uh, but there's one or two or three ingredients that are really important to make sure you get the most out of the experience as well as to make sure that you're suitable for the job because the hours are quite long and the work is quite intensive. Um, so coming in knowing that is really important. Um, and those are the four, three or four things we really test for um, when we're looking to, to, to hire people both out of undergrad as well as out of, out of business school. So. Fantastic. And Tristan, I'll ask you a slightly different twist on the same question. So if I don't come from a, a, a business background, so if my major is not in business, if, for example, I am in social sciences or if I'm an engineer, can I still be considered for a, a career in consulting? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, when the consulting firms are hiring, whether it's out of uh, college or out of graduate programs, they're not hiring based on what your major is. They're not hiring you based on, you know, like no, they weren't hiring to hire a student because they're like, okay, this person has a finance major and therefore they're going to be really great in, in, you know, in consulting. It's really going to be more of the things that, that Shivika touched on. So I wouldn't be discouraged at all regardless of what your background is you could be majoring in you know uh, history and you know not a part of any sort of consulting club at all and, and still make it uh, through the process I think what it's going to take though if, if you don't have the kind of background in it in terms of what you're studying I think you do have to do something to demonstrate that you still have the skills in that way of thinking which I think boils down to um I'd say if you're going through the process and you can demonstrate both intellectual curiosity and you can also demonstrate structured communication, if you can do those two things, then I think they won't be so concerned with what your background is because they'll have confidence, uh, which goes to the learning mindset that Jivika touched on. They'll have con confidence that you'll learn on the job, um, which because of how much you're moving around from project to project, uh, they're really just looking for people that have the ability to learn. It doesn't matter what you, I knew nothing about about, fine, uh, about mining before uh, working on this project. And, and um, one of the things about these firms is when you're working on a project that there's a very quick ramp up period. So I went from knowing nothing about mining to being able to have a conversation with uh, you know, CEOs of, of like small mining companies uh, within the span of a few weeks. Um, and have actual comfort having those conversations. And it's not because of any other reason besides the job really trains you to kind of learn very quickly and ramp up on new industries and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be discouraged um, based on what your major is. I would, I would pick your major um, based on, you know, what you think you'll be successful at doing, what you'll, you'll, uh, you know, and, and then also people oftentimes ask, should I join X, Y, and Z club because it'll give me a leg up? I, I wouldn't join a club purely because it's going to give you a leg up in a recruiting process. Um, I would join clubs that you can, you know, do things like take on some sort of leadership role in the club. You'll be very passionate about it. You'll excel. You'll do something different. You'll do something outside of the box because that's also definitely valued by these uh, consulting firms as well. What sort of leadership skills do you have? Because when you take on those leadership initiatives, it helps with the communication piece. It, it helps with the uh, multitasking piece, which is a huge part of this job, uh, which I think all of those boil up into uh, client EQ, which is one of the things that, that uh, Shivika had touched on as well. So um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, as was mentioned, it's one of the beautiful things about the job is it really doesn't matter what background you come in with. Um, it just matters that you have that desire to learn. Awesome. Shrivika, do you have anything to add in terms of background? No, I think uh, Justin really covered that. I, I, I'd be belaboring points if I added anything on. 
pass them. So yeah, and, and my experience as well, so as, as I mentioned, I was a lawyer. I was not very numerical, to be honest. The first time I, after I joined McKinsey, I was given an Excel spreadsheet and it was the first time I had ever opened Excel. And I thought it literally was a Word document that just had columns. So I just typed all my text into the boxes. Um, so if you come from a field like, you know, social sciences, psychology, uh, history, as Tristan mentioned, where you're not as numerical, um, or, you know, exposed to numbers as some of the other fields like finance or business, it's still, it's still one that you can, you can apply for, right? It's still one that you will learn on the job. A lot of the, a lot of con the consulting firms will have very good training programs to get people from different backgrounds up to speed quickly on the basic skills. Okay, uh, so on recruiting, uh, Tristan and Trevika, I've heard some things about this case study. It sounds very, very scary. <laughs> Trevika, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about what a case study is. <laughs> Uh, so I might did my last one so many years ago, but yes. Um, so essentially what consulting, uh, as Tristan mentioned, is really testing for a few basic skills. One is, do you have cre uh, analytical thinking? The two is, are you good with numbers? The three is, are you able to come to conclusions and work from a hypothesis driven approach? Um, and what a case study is really doing is giving you bits of information and seeing how you will ask further questions to get more data and then once you have the data, use that data to come up with a logical answer. And in a consulting case, uh, there's a range of answers when it comes to a recommendation. There's always the right math, but there's always a range of possibilities in terms of recommendations that you can come to with that math. Um, and what they're really trying to test is how, um, what is your business judgment or your acumen when it comes to taking some information, structuring that information, and using um, a driver-driven approach to kind of solve for an answer. Um, so what it's testing for is, if, for example, two people may come in and be given the same amount of information. The first person may get an answer pretty quickly and it might be the right answer, but they may not have taken a structured approach to getting to that answer. Um, in, in terms of looking at all of the different pieces of information. And why that's important is if you go back to the analogy of a doctor is you want to be, you want to be looked after by someone who is willing to go through all of the possible uh, reasons as to why you may have an issue and come up with a clear diagnosis based on all of that information versus someone who just like jumps to a conclusion based and it may be right, but they're just jumping to a conclusion. So what it's really testing is your ability to take a, take a particular problem, structure it to look at all of the different dimensions, um, look at the data and the evidence, um, and then come up with the recommendation. Um, so that's, that's the essence of what a, what a case study really is trying to do. Fantastic. And Tristan, so if, if, I've, if today's the first time I've ever heard of the word case study and it's sending me into a bit of a panic, uh, what can I do to learn a little bit more? Yeah, um, so I think that there are resources out there. As an example, there's a book called Case in Point, which every consultant will probably have no known about and looked at at least briefly or to varying different levels before going into it. So um, there's things that you can do, but I, I, I mean, a case study is basically just like a simulation of a business problem that, uh, that a company is going through. Um, and I think the best way to go about actually learning this skill is to just do what we'll call like mock cases. So speak with somebody who's in consulting or somebody who's a few years ahead of you at university or an alumni and have them basically give you one of these mock cases and turn it into a feedback discussion. So, you know, it'd usually be, uh, you know, call it a 30 minute case, but then make sure that you leave some time, 10, 15 minutes on the back end just to uh, have them give you feedback because it's not something that nobody's just going to do a case the first time and it's going to go well. It's a very specific skill that is learned through practice. Um, and I, in college, I, I drastically underestimated the amount of time uh, that it would take to prepare for these cases. So I remember after my Morgan Stanley internship, I had the offer to go back to Morgan Stanley and I was like, no, I think I want to go into consulting. Um, and so I got the interviews with the consulting firms, but I just completely struck out. Um, and I didn't really realize how much prep was needed until I was actually in the interview setting. I had maybe done like 
five or 10 mock cases and went into these interviews and just, um, you know, it, like I, I remember my BCG interview in college I, is, is one of the few interviews where like 10, 15 minutes into the interview, I kind of wanted, I knew I wasn't getting the job at that point. I kind of wanted to be like, <laughs> kind of wanted to save the interview time and be like, I'll just head out now. <laughs> um, but it comes, it comes with practice. And then in business school, I, you know, the reverse of that, I probably did about like 80 mock cases, which I definitely think is on a very extreme, you know, extreme side, but I wanted to be after that experience in college, I wanted to go into the feeling um, over prepared as opposed to under prepared. Um, so I, I share that just to say that, like, when you're starting to learn these cases and do these mock cases, it, it's probably not going to come easy. I, I actually can't think of a single person who um, mentioned that the first time they did these case interviews, they felt comfortable. It, it actually, you know, it might take 10 or 20 before you even start to feel like in the realm of like comfortable um, and that you, because there's a certain way that you have to speak, which may be unnatural as an example, when it comes to math um, and the analytical thing, it's not just about getting the correct answer. In fact, it's less about getting the correct answer. It's more about how you communicate and talk through that. So doing mental math is something that I was like, okay, that's maybe easier for me than actually talking through that math in a structured way was just a skill that I hadn't uh, practiced before. So I'd say if this is a completely foreign concept to you in terms of what these case studies are, start just by, um, you know, having somebody who works at a consulting firm um, and who's ideally somebody who you, you, you feel close with that can give you very real and candid feedback. Um, just do a few mock cases with them to begin so that you can get a hang of uh, understanding what this actually is when we talk about it. Because at the end of the day, um, it is the deciding factor between whether or not you get a job in, in consulting. Um, you know, net, like people talk about networking all the time. There's no real way to like network past the case interview. You have to demonstrate that you have that consulting skill set. Um, and so, uh, it's it's if you're interested in it, I definitely make sure you're allocating the time to really prepare for these case interviews. Thank you so much, Tristan. That's really really helpful. And so for for mentees, the good thing is you're all in this mentorship program, and a lot of your mentors will either be, be very familiar with consulting or will be able to connect you with someone another mentor who's very familiar with consulting. Either they've been in consulting before, or they are still in consulting, or they've even gone for interviews but never took the job. So be, there'll be someone who can help you. Uh, so reach out to your mentor if this is a field that you're interested in, and say, hey, can you help me on this? Uh, the other the other resource as Tristan mentioned, alumni. So look for the alumni um, in your network if people have done your program or even just reach out to people. And lastly, the three of us, we will share a way for you to connect with us uh, in, in the chat so that you can connect with us on LinkedIn. If you cannot find anyone who can help you, um, please do reach out to us. Okay. So with that, I'm going to move pivot to a slightly different question. So in the mentees, uh, in the mentee group, we here we have uh, both people who are pursuing a degree program, so bachelor programs, as well as diploma programs. Okay, can you talk about career paths? Well, I guess what roles would people coming into uh, consulting into your into your firm from a degree program as well as from a diploma program? And Shabika, maybe if I could start with you. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so not all of consulting is, uh, so there's different aspects of the business, right? There is the aspect that is dealing with clients um, and doing the pure consulting job, but there's also aspects in the business such as uh, there's a legal team, we have a finance team, we have a really great research and analytics team, we have, um, so there's many different areas of the business that can be considered as well. Um, and I think uh, also developing the expertise and say doing the research, working in our legal teams, working in our finance teams are also best in class. I think that's also an option to keep in mind. A lot of consulting firms now are expanding. So for example, we have um, a recruiting team within the consulting firm. So it's almost like thinking about having an external um, HR, like a, like a recruiting and hiring team, but in consulting where we help up uh, both our alumni as well as our clients actually um, find jobs and uh, get placements and make these connections and help with interview prep. So there's many different actually functions within the consulting business. And very often we just talk about the pure consulting job, but there's lots of different options. So I think um, depending on your interests, 
um, you, you can look for that. I think when it comes to the pure consulting client facing role, which is kind of what Tristan and I do, um, the cutoffs are slightly higher in terms of like grade point averages, uh, needing to need um, just a more holistic approach on your resume. So there's a little bit of that that gets factored into account. Um, and the thresholds are slightly lower when it comes to um, looking at more research driven jobs or uh, more internal um, knowledge, knowledge specialist roles. Um, so there's that spectrum of types of things that you could also look at. Um, depending on on what your your degrees are and and how um, your 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 scores stack up. Got it. Perfect. Uh, Tristan, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I would. I would say it's uh it's very similar uh in in terms of how I would describe it. And I would just say as you're thinking about the consulting industry, I think that um, people tend to talk a lot about uh, what they think of as consulting, which means like being in that consulting seat, but I would really actually take a look at some of the other seats as well and be ho more holistic uh, in terms of how we think about these consulting firms. Because similarly, when I was an undergrad, when I thought of financial services, I only thought of investment banking. Um, and what I learned from my experience at Morgan Stanley was I, I, I really did not like investment banking as probably, you know, it's a two year program, but I left after a year and it's probably the worst year of my life. Um, and, uh, I wanted to quit Morgan Stanley. And then I talked to a mentor that was like, you do realize like Morgan Stanley is a very big firm. Like there's all of these different divisions, all of these different roles. Um, have you even like looked at, uh, at, at the other things within the firm? Uh, and I hadn't, and I realized as soon as I I did start asking around that actually there's a lot of different things within this firm. And as soon as I switched over into sales and trading, it was like night and day and I, and I loved it. Um, and, you know, I raised that point because you might really, as you're talking to these consulting firms, you might say, Hey, I really like Bain. I really like BCG. I really like, you know, McKinsey, Oliver, Wyman, Deloitte, whatever the firm is. Um, and you might say, I really like these companies, but you know, the consulting role just doesn't necessarily feel right. Um, recognize that there are so many different roles that go on um, in different ways for us to be able to do the, 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 the business that we're doing. Um, and so I would really uh, think it's worthwhile to explore holistically, explore these firms holistically. And it'll also help you if you do explore it and you decide, no, I want to go the, the, you know, the, I want to be the role, I want to be the management consultant. It also is just extremely helpful to have a deep understanding of what these roles entail and what they do. It'll make your, your life, your job a lot easier. Um, so I would say there's no lost time, even if you end up doing that exploration and decide, no, I do want to do consulting, but I would just, I would keep an open mind to all of these, um, all of these opportunities. Great. And, and from my end, I would just add that while most of the consulting roles will look for someone with a degree, so with a bachelor's degree, there are roles open to people who have a, a diploma as well. So uh, back in my time, and I'm not sure whether it's still the situation at McKinsey now, there was the, the, the people with degrees would come in as business analysts and people with diplomas would come in as associate consultants. And after one year as an associate consultant, if you, if you, if you do really well and you stay on with the firm, then you become a, a business analyst um, as well. And then the other path, as Shavika said, is there are also uh, different paths that are non-consultant roles. So, for example, in the research in the research group, um, there are different there are different requirements. So, whatever firm you're interested in, uh, do connect with someone from there. Do look at their website to see, you know, what are the entry levels that they require, what are the requirements that they have, and whether you need a degree, whether uh, the diploma is okay whether you need a master's. In most cases, you don't need a master's, but some firms that are very, very specialist, they do require a lot more experience in that particular area. But if they're a, a financial consulting firm, then they might require a more advanced degree um, in that area. Okay, so with that, uh, one more question from me and then I'll open it to the audience. So career path, what's a typical career path for someone on a consultant track in your firm? Shavika, if I can start with you. Sure. 
Um, so I think uh, the the career trajectory in consulting is actually quite structured. I think that's one of the really nice things about the job is that as long as you do well and you perform at your tenure, it's very lean. It's like a very straight path and everybody knows what that path is. So there's very little politicking. There's very little your career depends on if there is a vacancy available. There's none of that. It's all about how do you do and how do you perform? And it's very strict, like very clear, I wouldn't say strict, very clear, like criteria for every six months that you're on. Um, so typically when you start out at being as an undergrad, so as a first year analyst, you do two years of what we call associate consultant. Then we do one year of what you call a senior associate consultant. So it's three years really as an analyst role, junior analyst and senior analyst. Um, and then after that, you go into what is called the consultant role. And then you're consultant for two years. Um, and every year, as the clock changes, you change your tenure changes. As long as you're performing, you get rated, you move up. Um, and then we have what we call the case team leader or manager role, which is where you're you're trying to really be you're in, in your trial year to be a senior manager um, and uh, learn how to do the job of a senior manager. You then get to senior manager, which is really your, 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 you hold your case teams together in a lot of ways and help deliver the projects help um, engage with the clients, et cetera. And then you do that for about two or three years and then get to partner. So it's a very clear linear trajectory. Um, and the nature of the job obviously changes as you go up and you become more senior. When you're an analyst, you're really focusing on one particular piece of work and cracking that work stream. When you're a consultant, you are driving multiple different work streams based on your um, on the scope of your work. Um, when you are a senior manager, the kind of project relies on you and you're holding that glue together. Um, and then when you are associate partner or partner, you have multiple different projects that you're on um, and you're relying on your team to kind of help deliver that. Um, so the role changes, the type of work changes, um, but it's a very defined path uh, as you go through it. As you go through it. Great. Is there any big differences with uh, the process at uh, BCG? Uh, the titles are different, but the structure is I, pretty much the same. Uh, so I guess the only thing I'd say is as you're going through and you're talking to these different firms, definitely make sure that you're using the lingo that is aligned with that particular firm, right? So if you're talking to somebody at Bain, make sure you're saying case team lead. Uh, you know, a BCG project leader, McKinsey engagement manager, little subtleties, I think are a way as you're going through this process and talking to different firms are, are a good way of indicating that you've like done the research. The other thing I would say is the same for um, like the industries that you're interested in or the type of work that you want to do. Um, and we all call them different things, right? So, you know, I, I think like a BCG might call it healthcare services and, you know, uh, McKinsey might call it healthcare payers and providers or something like that. I don't know what the actual terminology is um, for either. I don't know why I picked the healthcare example, but um, but make sure that you're just using the 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 terminology of the company that of the person that you're talking to. It's a it's a subtle indication, but um, I find that a lot of times uh, people will get them mixed mixed up. Um, and, you know, I'll talk to a lot of people that are like, I'm really interested in being like an engagement manager at, at BCG. And I'm like, well, so, um, I, I, it, uh, but, but in terms of the process, it looks, it looks very similar to everything that, that Shiva could describe super structured. Um, you'll get promotions every few years and you'll continue to get an increasing amount of, uh, responsibilities. Fantastic. Um, yeah, and exactly what Tristan and Shivika said, pretty much for anyone coming out as a fresh grad from a bachelor's program or a diploma program, it'll be a two or three year uh, program, whether it's called analyst or associate consultant or some other term. Um, and at the end of it, you, you, know, you, you basically decide whether you want to continue as a consultant, whether you'd like to go to business school or get an advanced degree, or whether you'd like to leave and do something else, go and work in uh, industry, which is basically non-consulting firms. Uh, so, so it's basically a two or three year uh, program when you first when you first sign up. Okay. And I let me squeeze in one more question. So for both of you, what are some of the trade-offs that people consult considering a career in consulting should be aware of? Kristen, maybe I'll start with you. 
Sure. Um, so I'd say definite, uh, some trade-offs you'll definitely come across. And I actually think thinking through the trade-offs is really important. One of the, the big trade-offs that I think in consulting will be just personal time. Um, it's, it's a very demanding job uh, that not only are you working a lot of hours, but you're also in normal circumstances, you're uh, traveling all the time. Obviously, that's not the case now. And I, I maybe have set a consulting record because I've been 18 months in a consulting job and I've never had to get on a plane for work. <laughs> so, but that's obviously just because of um, uh, the pandemic and everything. But uh, you're, I mean, really think about what that means in terms of not sleeping in your own bed from, you know, Monday to Thursday, if you are traveling and the consulting firms, um, you know, Bain tends to have a little bit more of a localized model, which I'm sure Shiva could talk, can talk about. So maybe the likelihood of traveling is a little bit lower, which I actually think is a huge benefit. Um, but you know, everybody views it differently. Some people love to travel. Some people don't love to travel personally. I like to sleep in my own bed. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and the other thing I would say is, um, just in terms of like relationships, uh, whether it's family, friends, significant others, any of that stuff, it, it, it consulting is such an abnormal way of working that it seems so normal for consultants. Um, but it's not necessarily something that's going to be easy for your friends to, to explain when you're like, hey, can you have dinner on Tuesday at, at, at 8 p.m.? And it's like, well, I'll let you know at 7.55 p.m. Like that's, that's something that every single consultant would understand. Um, but your friends who are in industry or who are working at other companies are going to have much more predictability around their schedules than, than consultants will have. And so that's something that like, really takes a lot of getting used to. So I think that um, it's a, the, the, the mainly the, the biggest trade-offs I would say of going into consulting revolve around um, lifestyle and the restrictiveness of it that comes from the lack of predictability that you have on the job. Fantastic. Yes, I definitely remember those days. <laughs> so. uh, Tavika, how about you? What are some trade-offs or what is one big trade-off that the our mentee should be aware of? I think the one that Tristan hit on is the most pertinent one. Um, you really do have to, um, I think one of, the, but speaking from personal experience, I think when I did, I did it right out of undergrad, I don't think I realized I was making that trade off consciously. And I think it just, I just kind of rolled into it. Uh, and then three and a half years in, four years in, I woke up one day and it's like, um, my life doesn't look like the way I thought it would look or wanted it to look. Uh, just from outside of work perspective. And I think I needed to take stock and be like, okay, I need to be more intentional about the way I make my choices and how I make those choices. So I think um, knowing that knowing that going in and knowing that you have to make those trade-offs going in and being intentional about making sure you spend time with friends and family and, and your loved ones and carving out that time uh, in a way that's thought becomes really important at, on this job because otherwise... Um, we're so eager, especially when you just finished and it's your first job to prove yourself and do well. Um, you kind of get lost in that. Uh, in, 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 and work gives you so much validation as well because it is a fun job. It's not like it's not fun. Um, but then you realize that 80% of your life becomes work when you may want it to be more 50-50. Um, so uh, being knowing that going in, I think, becomes quite important. Definitely. And I'm, you know, I'm still in touch with friends that I made when I joined consulting, because when you go through that kind of experience together, you really become friends for life. So when you've, when you've done all nighters in the office and you see the sun go down and then you still, and you see the sun go up, <laughs> come up again uh, in the office, you know, when all your, all your other friends, like Kristen said, say, basically, I'm not, go I'm going to stop inviting you to dinner because you never show up. So then all your friends become your consulting friends, um, you definitely have, you definitely create uh, relationships for life, for life there. So it is definitely very challenging, but also a lot of rewards. Okay, so with that, we will open it to questions. Uh, Tristan and Shrivika, we do have a question that, Lo that Lois posted earlier. Um, and maybe uh, Shrivika can take the first part of her question and Tristan, you can take the second. So the, the question was, um, Shrivika, what are some of the challenges you learned in your first year in consulting? Um, so the challenge, let me think back. I think, um, so I remember my first ever consulting, I was, I was doing the diligence and I remember 
the whole team was you're, you're quite time strapped and everybody's doing many many different things and i remember my my manager at the time said go figure out what the market of animal feed looks like in indonesia or in vietnam i can't even remember which one it was and i remember sitting there pulling all of this data from euro monitor and data monitor and all of these different sources um and being there and being like well this number tells me one thing and then this number tells me one thing i don't really know what the answer is like am i supposed to am i supposed to take these for face value am i supposed to come up with what is what should the market be based on triangulation of all of these different sources and i remember sitting there and feeling so overwhelmed um and being like how do i solve this problem um and what someone else who was senior to me on the case bit literally was like go and ask and say this is what you have this is the information you have this is how i think we should approach it do you agree and i remember that piece of advice was so critical because it it changed how i approached consulting from being like i need to go and solve a problem and come back with the perfect answer to being like i need to find a way to collaborate through the right answer and make sure what i'm doing is is right as long as i'm structured and thoughtful and i use that approach right now even when i'm a senior manager i like collaborate with my partners and be like here's what i think we should do here's where i'm stuck can you help here um and that's the beauty of consulting is that it is a team sport it's not an individual sport um and learning that upfront really changes your perspective because people who often get really stressed or like um find the job less sustainable is because you put all of this pressure on yourself to be like i need to be the sole person that cracks this problem um versus in reality it's very much a team sport so that for me was a big a big lesson that i learned in my first year and that everybody was there is there for you and being specifically our culture is we have the saying which is a beanie never lets another beanie down so like no matter what situation you're in someone on your team will step in to help you um even if they they're working crazy hours and the idea is that you just need to make sure you ask uh for that support so oh i so can relate with that shrivika i mean 100% agree i think that the biggest learning in the first year as a consultant is being is being comfortable with ambiguity being comfortable that you don't have the answer right because so much of of our education system is there is the answer right and we when you get the answer then you get full marks or you get an a and in consulting very often these are new questions i mean if they were easy questions the client would not be paying you a lot of money <laughs> to help them solve it so a lot of times there is no correct answer it's more a it's more a logical and thought through way of 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 coming up with it so being very comfortable that you don't know the answer but you can come up with a answer that appears to be logical and correct and then i think the other thing is also you know how do you speak up as a as a new person in this field where people in the room are a lot more experienced and are a lot more um maybe knowledgeable whether they are client team members or whether they are the other your managers or other people in the, in, in the room right and speaking up is very critical i remember my first year we had you know i was taken to client meetings where there were senior ministers like singapore ministers in the room there were ceos of capital land like big companies and the managers like saying you have to say something because otherwise why are you in the room and i'm thinking my god i'm like 22 years old 23 years old what am i going to say that is even worth the 30 seconds that they you know that they're going to listen to me say it but you just have to you just have to figure it out and it's good it's the way you push yourself to continue growing out of the comfort zone so definitely that's a big learning uh in in consulting particularly but also any other career that you do it that is a big jump from going from the school world to the working world Kristen anything you want to add on a big learning before you take Louise's second question Yeah no I I mean I think that covers it well so maybe I'll go into the second uh question just in case there's time for others as well um I'd say that uh for for me the um after you've kind of demonstrated that you have the construct the communication the sure thinking all of the things that they're looking for first and foremost I'd say probably in those final interviews especially if the person that's interviewing you is more of like a partner or more of a senior person they may be looking more from a a fit perspective uh, both internally do we feel like this person's going to fit well on the team and then also do we feel like we would have a lot of confidence putting this person in front of a client um which is in part communication but it's also not just how you communicate but just how you carry yourself do you carry yourself with uh you know confidence for lack of a better way of being able to describe it um that example that Adeline is mentioning if you're in the room with the CEO of this company 
Um, even if you really don't feel like you have something to say, you have to, you know, get to a point where you feel comfortable at least attempting to, um, because that's the only way it's, a, it's an apprenticeship model. And this is the only way that eventual partners of the, these companies are formed is by people that are junior level stretching themselves beyond what they think is they're comfortable in their role doing. So I'd say that that's maybe uh, something that they'll start to look for towards the latter parts of the interviews as well. But I think that um, I wouldn't go into like your first round interview saying, okay, this is my test for communication and problem solving. And then in the last interviews, I wouldn't go into it saying, okay, this is my test for um, you know, fit and everything like that. It, all parts of the evaluation are kind of in the back of people's heads um, throughout the whole process. I just think that generally speaking, when you have a, you know, a project leader or somebody who's a few years out of school uh, interviewing you, they're, they're much more focused on the, the tangible, like the tangible parts of the job than when you have like a managing director that's sitting in front of you, they, he or she will oftentimes think a little bit higher level um, and so I would, I would maybe that not to say that you should approach that differently, but just, um, and not to say that's even the case all the time. Cause sometimes you might just have a super analytical partner that, you know, they've been at doing consulting for 20 years, but still, you know, they're just all about laser focused on the numbers. And, and so I would say, um, yeah, there's the element of like, did you knock the case out of the park? But then there's also that, that question of just, fit and, and, and confidence in the way that you carry yourself. Thank you so much. And we have five more minutes and this is where I'd like to challenge you, all of you to step out of your comfort zone. So ask us a question. You have five more minutes with three people here who collectively have probably what over 20 years, over 30 years of experience in consulting. So this is your chance, step out of your comfort zone, ask us a question. There's no silly question. And as a consultant, that's one thing that you have to get used to. There is no silly question. And also, if you can turn on your videos, that would help. And Tristan and Tarika, while we're waiting for questions, if you want to type in a way for them to contact you, it can be your LinkedIn, it can be your email. Thanks, Tristan. It can be your uh, email address as well. Okay, come on. Surely someone has some question. If you're, cons if you're considering a career in consulting, you have to have a question. Uh, uh, what I like the common like misconceptions of being a consultant. Great job, Yunsan. Thank you so much for asking. So what are some of the common misconceptions? Uh, Shubika, do you want to take that question? Yes, that is all sexy and glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can be, but because when you're sitting in a room with uh, a global CEO and a global head of supply chain and doing and really creating impact, it is pretty cool. Um, um, but it's not all it's not all glamorous. Um, and I think as much as staying in these fancy hotels and flying around looks very exciting, and they might be for a few years, it often takes a toll uh, in different aspects of your life, as Tristan mentioned. Um, so I would go into that a little bit eyes wide open. It's fun the first few years, and then, um, but it's not all. It's not all um, as sexy and glamorous as it looks. Very nice job, Yun San. Someone Thank else, come on. I agree. Thank maybe you. I'll maybe I'll take this question that uh, Hakeem just posted since it blends uh, sales and trading and then also consulting. Um, I, I think that consulting gives you a good skill set if what you're doing is like long term investing in companies, meaning if you're trying to assess. Um, an industry and where it makes sense to invest in a particular industry, or if you're looking at investing the way that like Warren Buffett would invest, meaning very long term, he's not looking to do day trading and stocks, then yes, I think that consulting will be very helpful. In terms of day trading and, and like stock trading uh, for short term gains, I, I think that consulting experience will not be very helpful for, um, for that. It tends to just be... Um, yeah, if, if that's what you're interested in, I think that a role within financial services is going to suit you much better because um, we're not, as consultants, we're not glued to Bloomberg um, and the financial markets in the same way that uh, your peers who are in uh, financial services, especially those who are in sales and trading, are like really glued to it, digesting every single bit of information. And that's the kind of pattern recognition um, when they can hear 
you know, a, a very influential figure make a comment and then know the impact that that's going to have on the stock price. That's the kind of pattern recognition that you would need for more of the short term investing type of stuff. You're not going to get any of that in consulting. Um, but if you're talking about it like long term evaluating industries and evaluating companies, uh, consulting will actually give you a pretty good foundation for that. That's that's a brilliant answer, Tristan. Completely agree. If you have if you have time to monitor the stock market on a on a day to day basis, then clearly you know you you're not in consulting because you have no time to do anything apart from get sleep and eat right? and and do your PowerPoint slides. Um, and then the other thing, obviously, if you come across any information that's confidential as part of your client work, you're not supposed you can't trade on it. It's illegal, right? So you have, you can become an insider. But as Tristan said, long term trends, yeah, you learn to think that way. You learn to think strategically. Great, thank you so much, Hakeem, for asking the question. Anyone else? If not, we will close the session. I have one last question. Please, Mitch, yes, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Shavika and Tristan, and also Adeline for sharing. That was so welcome. Um, I think I would be the odd one out here because I'm doing a course in biomedical science, which is like so out of left field. So, um, but I would still love to learn more about consulting and consultancy. So my question would be for someone who is out of the kind of the industry, uh, who would love to connect with um, um, senior managers like y'all or maybe some other consultant that I would love to connect with, what can I do to add value so that you know, um, uh, I could be able to learn a bit more and at the same time add value to those people's, um, you know, as well? Is that the question? Yeah. Like, like what can I do? Sure. Fantastic. Very clear. So if you don't come from a traditional business background, can you, can you still consider a career in, in consulting as we've been talking about? Shrivika, if you want to take that question. Absolutely. I think just to answer this one earlier as well, and I think we've hired, for example, PhDs who've done, who've had backgrounds in biomedical engineering. We've hired art students, we've hired history students, and we've hired English majors. So I think um, I think one is it's a misnomer that you just have to have a business background in order to get into consulting. I think fields, especially such as engineering and biosciences, you're using such a core part of your analytical toolkit and like logical thinking, critical thinking toolkit. And I think it's really valued and appreciated. Um, there's also practices like the healthcare practice where your skill sets are really valuable, um, especially in this part of the world where that type of industry is growing. Um, so I think, so I would approach it less as how can I add value while having those conversations? I think everybody in consulting, when you're, when we're looking to hire people, we're also, it's a people job. Um, so we're also looking to bring in the best talent. So people are very willing to make the time to have those conversations. Um, and everyone's cognizant that you're, you're learning a degree, you're starting up, and therefore there's not that much give and take in that equation at that point. Um, but the value for us is making sure we get the best talent into the organization. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily approach it from a perspective of, I need to make sure I'm giving back in this conversation. I think you're giving back in your, in your curiosity and asking intelligent questions and making sure you've done your research and understanding the firm. Um, and and creating a suitable fit for the organization. And then if you do join, that's the give back that you do. Um, so don't feel compelled to go into these interactions being like, what's the information that I can provide? Um, go in saying, I'm gonna be the most curious version of myself that I can be um, and state why I'm interested in this particular organization, but do your diligence on the culture, on the people, on, on what makes that firm different uh, from the rest. Tristan, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, so I agree with all of that, but I, I, I uh, well, maybe one thing I'll add is if you do want to try and find a way, because I, when I think about relationship building, I oftentimes do think about, is there something that I can do that is going to make this, like that, that, that's going to help this person or that they will appreciate? So let's say you use your background and then you go on, you know, any of these consulting firms, you can go on their website and you can look at articles that have been published on a whole lot of different topics. So one of the things that I find really helpful is like, as an example, if you were to go um, and look at articles that were published in the healthcare space, find one article that really resonates with you, reach out to, you know, one of the authors of the, the paper, ideally reach out to the most ju junior author of the paper, at least initially, um, reach out to that person and say, hey, I'm, you know, a, a president of the healthcare club at SMU. 
um, making this up, but like, hey, I'm president of the healthcare club at SMU. There's 20 students that are really interested in the intersection of healthcare and consulting. Would it be okay if I set up like a 30 minute conference call where we can just ask you some specific questions around like how you're able to kind of work at the intersection of these two things. Like that's the kind of outreach that like consultants will generally be like happy to help with because that's really impactful. That person's gonna be able to have one 30 minute conversation and help 30 people. Um, you know, it, it, it's a much more impactful way of reaching out than what I think the majority of people do, which is they reach out and they just say, hi, I'm a student and I'm interested in consulting, can we talk? Um, and that's like way too high level and, and kind of generic for us to be able to have the one-on-one -on -one conversation with everybody that reaches out in that way. So I would actually, um, for you and for everybody else, I would more so try and flip the question and think about how your background makes you unique. Um, and then just try and connect with people who are in consulting who will kind of appreciate that because for sure there'll be people in consulting with like that kind of um, biochemical background or, 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 you know, the background that you have. So um, that's maybe how I would think about it, but I think you can find a lot through these websites and by reaching out to the authors of some of these pieces. Yeah, I would, I would completely add that, you know, Mitch, the good thing about consulting is there's honestly no non-traditional background because everyone that you can think of has been hired. I mean, there was a guy who, who had been hired at the same time as I did, and he, he, he just finished his uh, MD program, his medical doctor program in the US, which is like a 10-year program because in the US, you have to do your undergrad and then your medical school. So he had spent 10 years trying to be a doctor, and then he came and joined McKinsey and uh, his first project was in oil and gas. So obviously he had no clue, uh, oil and gas, right? Um, but he, he became an oil and gas expert in, uh, in, that, in that industry. And then he became an organizational um, expert from a functional perspective. So as you can tell, very little to do with the background that he had spent 10 years training for, uh, which is brilliant. Now, if you're looking to leverage your biomedical background, which is a fantastic very, very marketable background that you have there. If you're looking to be a biomedical researcher, then obviously consulting is not the field for you. Um, but if you're looking to consult with companies uh, in the biomedical space, then obviously that'd be very interesting to, um, to firms. Though uh, the biggest thing as they look at, that, they, that firms look for, as Tristan and Shibika have mentioned many times, is the ability to learn. It's not the knowledge that you come in, it's the ability to learn and the ability to uh, to, to take on new things, right? So and the good thing is, you know, you've invested at this point, say three to four years in whatever field of study you're doing right now, you still have a 25 year career ahead of you. There are many more things that you haven't learned yet. So, uh, you know, you have to look at it as what else can I learn and pivot. And if you find I want to stay in biomedical and in that space, great, there's a healthcare practice that you can work on. If you find, no, I want to work in oil and gas, right? Or I want to look at, work in something else, that's also fine, you pivot as long as you have that ability to learn. Okay, last, last, thank you so much, Mitch, for, for, for stepping up and asking that question. Uh, thanks for the amazing, amazing advice, because uh, I had that conflict whereby I have to make their time worthwhile, but um, the advice that you all gave was, uh, it's, it's really great and actionable, so thank you very much. Appreciate it. Fantastic. And yes, please, all three of us have dropped our contact details in the, in the chat, so do connect with us, uh, and also obviously connect with your mentors that you have as well. Anyone else? Quickly, you have us for one more minute. Ask now. No? Mm, no. Uh, yes. In general, like, how do you think we can all like work on ourselves since like we are students and like we're still learning? So what are some things that we can do to help ourselves like be better? That's a deep question. I'm still asking that today. <laughs> Shabika, go ahead. I was going to ask specifically, um, which aspect are you thinking about? So is it more on your, uh, and it's quite a broad question, but is it specifically on problem solving, specifically on, on like um, teams and EQ and impact? There's many different things. So I would, I would encourage you to think about which aspect you really feel like you need to focus on and you'd, you would want to go deeper on um, and then that might help um, take the first step uh, in that journey. Thank you. Tristan, anything you want to add there? 
Yeah, um, I, I would say one thing that I spend a lot of time doing is uh, actually journaling. Uh, anything that you can do that is a reflective exercise, I think you will find a tremendous amount of value in doing that. I think that self-improvement begins with uh, an understanding of who you are today. Uh, um, and then as you ground yourself in who you are today, then I start to think that the natural next thought will become okay, well, who do I want to become, whether that's personally or professionally. So one thing that I do is every morning uh, when I wake up, before I look at my phone, before I look at any sort of technology, I'll write in a journal. Um, and I'll just basically, those are in my mind, those are like the most purest thoughts that I have because it's not influenced by an email that I got, a text message that I got, a piece of news that I read. It's just what's on my mind. Um, so I found that really helpful in understanding myself um, and then that has laid the foundation for me then having thoughts around okay how can I then become a better version of myself in whatever area that I'm looking to improve so I think reflection can be a really good starting point. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, let me. I was looking. Uh, one thing I'll say, you know, as, as a 40 something year old now, I realized that life is not about, you will never get to the end point. I mean, if you honestly, if you get to the end point, you know what that means, right? So we're always work in progress. There's always something that can be, that you can do better um, in some part of your life. And in fact, there's always many things you can do better in some part of your life. I think what's critical is focusing on a few and really taking, putting in the effort to, as Tristan said, understand where you're at, understand where you'd like to be. And, and look for who can help you or what can help you to, to bridge that gap. But don't try and solve everything at the same time. Uh, I would say in the context of consulting, when I was a first-year consultant, so you, you have these, um, these grids, the comp, comp, is it comp, competence, I forget what's the right term, but it's basically a competence thing, right? That says, okay, how good are you at your analytics? How good are you at presenting? How good are you, are you at your team management, your planning? I mean, there's many, many, there's probably 20 elements, right? And as a first-year consultant, I was obviously very early stage in most of these elements, right? And there's no way you can work on all 20, all the 18 elements that you're not at a three, right? Which is the highest grade, right? You, so it takes time. So you say, okay, over the next six months, I want to work on these things. I want to work on my, you know, typically I pick one hard skill and one soft skill. So a hard skill would be some kind of knowledge. It can be industry knowledge. It can be my financial modeling. It can be my uh, writing memos, whatever it is, right? But pick one hard skill. And then pick one soft skill. So if you're familiar with soft skills, these are interpersonal relations. So it can be how I how I, I communicate to my, my client, how I present to my client, how I work as part of a team, how I manage my own time. So pick pick one and you know pick one or two at this at a time. Because if I say I want to do all 15 of this <laughs> in the next three months, you can imagine what's going to happen, right? It's going to be a complete failure, right? So I think it's you know it's it's thinking about what is most critical that you want to work on now and then focusing and having a clear action plan. Okay, but that's a great question. Okay, anyone else? No more? Well, if that's it, uh, thank you again so much for your time this morning. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more about career and consulting, what excites people who go into consulting, what the opportunities are in consulting, and also have some resources to reach out to if you'd like to learn more. I think uh, on behalf of Srivika, Tristan, uh, and all the other mentors on the HBSCS um, mentorship program, we're very excited to be able to help you uh, as you make these big decisions in life. It's not easy, but trust me, it, it will be very reward rewarding, whatever you choose. Okay, great. And thank you again so much. Have a wonderful day and a very Merry Christmas and uh, looking forward to 2021. Thank you, everyone. Hi everyone, happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Take Thank care. you. Thank you.